Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Computer Action Show, the behind-the-scenes footage. Uh, cut. You might notice that uh, I'm not exactly Brian. Um, I'm Jeremy. I'm usually running the camera from right. over there, but uh, I'm in front of it this time. We'll get in a little bit of why that yeah, is. Yeah, once the show starts rolling. So the video format will be a little different for this episode, mm -hmm. just because we usually have the uh, handy hands over there of Jeremy behind right. the camera. Changing, doing my magic. Doing his magic stuff that he does. Uh, so we won't have that for this episode, but that'll be just a temporary thing. Um, then we'll figure out a format <coughs> going forward. We'll get into that in the show. So I'll uh, start up the audio recording here. So you people that get the video version, get just these little extra bits here. You get, like, more show. Yeah. For the same price of free, you get it's more show. It's a lot show. like that. In fact, it is that. It's funny how that works out, mm -hmm. huh? All right. We are armed for recording. Give me some levels, Jeremy, real quick. Checking my levels. Checking, checking, checking. Checking my levels. Checking, check. Perfect, dude. We're ringing right up. Yeah. Well, nice. you know, when you're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. All right. Here we go in three, two. Did it record? There oh, it goes. That was weird. There's a lot of lag time there. Yeah. There? I wonder if the drive spun down. And so I had to spin up the hard drive. So uh, we're, he's like, what is this? Virtual desktoping? vnc would I'm vnc into a machine behind the camera. Yeah. To control the, the audio recording. All right. Here we go in three, two. Yeah. Now it's going just fine. So it must have been VNC. It mm -hmm. must have just been the hard drive. All right. Three, two. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Computer Action Show, Season 1, Episode 10. My name is Chris. And I'm Brian. No. 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 I'm Jeremy. We'll get into that in just a sec, but first, I have to tell everybody about this week in computer history. The integrated, the first integrated circuit computer was used in the uh, Apollo moonshot mission. The Apollo guidance computer, the AGC, as the people that were in the know referred, it to, referred to as, the was responsible for the guidance, navigation, and control com uh, computations in the Apollo space program. The AGC, remember I just told you what that mm -hmm, stood for, mm -hmm. <laughs> was the first computer to use integrated circuit logic board and occupied less than one cubic foot of Whoa. spacecraft. So real small. Tiny little computer. It was a major improvement. Uh, it stored data in 15-bit words with one parity bit. Don't get that wrong. And it had a memory cycle of 11.7 USEC. So don't wow. get that wrong either. <laughs> uh, astronauts communicated. When you're telling all your friends about this. Check this out, though. Astronauts communicated, right, when you're recanting. Uh, astro <laughs> astronauts communicated using the AGC, uh, with the AGC using the interface of DSKY, which stood for Display Keyboard, and you can find pictures over it on NASA's website. Um, it used digital displays and communicated with astronauts using verb and noun buttons. And it had a two-digit operation mode and command mode. Huh. Sounds really cool. And it and sounds like at the time that was really like what super advanced kind of space age. You might yeah, say. I and mean, they were really worried about putting circuit boards in space. They didn't know how it was going to react in space to the yeah. rays and whatnot. Yeah, so it sounds real space and aliens. Age. And it was it was space age technology there, Jeremy. Yeah. All right, so we should mention you're not Brian. No, I'm not. No, Brian. Thank you for noticing. You're, well, you know, it took me actually a few minutes, but uh, <laughs> when you said the name, it really had me thrown for a loop. Uh, Brian is uh, with the holidays and all. Brian has a lot going on. Plus, he's actually gotten a great job at, uh, offer. In uh, Arizona, we currently are, are in Washington, so, so he's also going to be else. packing for a little bit. And then once he gets settled and gets there, he'll be uh, joining us via Skype using a super high quality. Actually, we're also trying out another piece of software that's really cool uh, called Life Size Desktop. But we're still so kind maybe of in we'll the do a review space. on that. We just might. So in the meantime, Jeremy's going to be helping me out. Now, if you're watching the video version of this show or even the audio version, with the holidays, it's going to be a little bit shorter of a show and it's a little bit different format. Um, mm -hmm. But that said. I think it's going to work pretty good. We've got an interview at the end of the show if you're interested in an Android phone. Because I've been on this quest to find the perfect smartphone these days. You have. And we had a listener. His name was Leo. He said, I really want to talk to you about this HTC Hero. And I said, all right, let's come on the show. We'll talk about it. And we finally got him on. We have video, a video interview with him. That'll be at the end of the show. He'll play us out. So you can stick around after the news segment if you'd like to hear that. It's a pretty decent... Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Little, a decent, if you're interested in Android devices, I've been, I've been testing a BlackBerry this week. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I got to say, you know, coming from the iPhone to a BlackBerry, I'm just not impressed. So I've heard the, the same from uh, some of my friends as well. The apps just kind of are second rate. And yeah. they're expensive. Like, most apps are like $9.99, $10, where the same app is literally the same app is uh, $1.99 in the iTunes store. Like, that that whole uh, marketplace is I wonder the if that has something down. to do with the development cycle or, or porting it over. Or, or they make less sales on the BlackBerry. So Maybe they so they got to pump it up. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just... And then, you know, I heard a lot of people talking about the battery was so bad on the iPhone. So mm -hmm. my battery life is even shorter on the BlackBerry once I turned on Bluetooth. Huh. 
And on the iPhone, I had Bluetooth, 3G, and Wi-Fi on. So I'm now looking more toward the Androids, and uh, so I was. And really the Androids have been making a big push. You hear their ads all over the radio, and and I guess yes. there's probably television. I don't right. watch television. So I talked to this this guy named Leo, and he, and he you know he has he's been using his HTC Hero for about three months. I'm talking with Verizon to get a review unit of the Droid, so I might try that out. That'd be cool. So that's going to be upcoming in season two, starting in season two as well. We're going to do a little higher produced version of the video. Um, in high definition right now, this is the only show on Jupiter Broadcasting that we don't release in HD. Right. Because we rec- we, co- we record live and release that. Mm-hmm. Going forward, we're still going to have the live component, but it's going to be a better, um, higher quality version of the show. Right. And it'll, it'll be actually a lot like this episode will be, but with extra graphic Extra fanciness. graphics. And, um, you know, it's going to be season two of the Computer Action Show. Right. So that's so one that more better. That's twice as better. Right. You know, before we go on, though, Jeremy... We ought to say thanks to our buddies over at GoDaddy.com. We should say thanks to them. And you know what? Let me share a little story um, to you guys at home. Uh, it's the holidays, mm-hmm. as you can see from our wonderful backdrop. If they're watching the video version. Oh, right. This well, it's more of an audio show than anything. Well, then you can't see by looking in our backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> Picture something amazing. But it is the holidays. And recently I was hired to play Santa Claus. And it came, it came to my attention that really the holidays are about giving. Yes. And you know, of course. wouldn't you like to be Santa Claus? <laughs> Absolutely. I love the feeling of giving, Jeremy. (laughs) What do you have in mind? Well, what if you could give your friends a piece of something massive? Like the web? Like the internet. Nice. You could give them their own piece of the internet. (laughs) It could be theirs. How would you do such a thing? You go to GoDaddy. Oh, my goodness. Tell them about the specials we've got. There's a way they could save, but you know what? We've got the hookup. If you use our promo code Linux when you check out, you'll save 10% off any order. You can give give someone... A gift certificate so they can buy their own piece of the web and use our code Linux to save 10%. Or if maybe you want to make a website and dedicate it to them about how awesome they are, you can use our code Linux20 and save 20% off hosting plans. That's great. How do you like that? Merry Christmas. (laughs) Merry Christmas. And thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the Computer Action Show. All right. Well, without further ado, let's do the news. What's new in the news this week? Well, Jeremy, not bad, by the way. (laughs) Thanks. Our first story, our top story, the number one story on the news docket for this week. Mark Shuttleworth will be stepping down as Canonical's CEO. Now, Canonical makes Ubuntu. Canonical is the organization behind Ubuntu, and... um, I, I, they've been around for a few years now. I, I think when I think 2004. Two, yeah, 2004. Yeah. Ubuntu kind of just lit up the uh, distribution marketplace, or, and has just been or landscape, and has just been skyrocketing in popularity since. And then. we recently reviewed Ubuntu. We did the new we version of Ubuntu on this show. Yep, their latest version. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so Mark Shuttleworth has made a post and said that he'll be stepping down in 2010 on March 1st, which is a little bit out there, but not too far away. And uh, their chief operating officer, Jane Sibler, I think is her the pronunciation? Silber, Silber, looks like. Okay. Will become the uh, next chief executive officer when he steps down. Yeah. So they're taking in-house, someone in-house, and they're stepping in. And you know, uh, uh, this article goes on to say that Silber has been there actually almost as long as Shuttleworth as well. Right, so right, sure. I think this isn't as big of a deal as some people might think it is. I mean... Right. Now, what I find interesting, and I'll try, I'm trying to not be mean when I say this, is... Mark says that he's going to be freeing up more time to spend on product design, partnership, and customers. And then another post, he he also talks a little bit more about focusing on design. Um, That would be good. Although so far, I got to say, I'm not super thrilled with some of the design decisions that I gather have kind of come directly from Mark himself. So I'm hoping that means that that's because he hasn't had the time to focus on it. And so he's hoping the shift means he can dedicate the resources he needs. Because... I've been I've been trying Fedora out, and uh, I had some troubles getting it running. I've got it running now, and it's not anything Fedora's done. I, I think the Fedora art team is, is doing a great job. I think Ubuntu's team is doing a great job. But to me, I cannot get over the feeling that GNOME feels like a last-generation mm. desktop environment. Mm-hmm. It just does not look yeah. modern. Functionally, it's great. Right. But the problem is, is first impressions are huge when you're trying to bring new adopters onto your platform. Yeah. They really need to step up the design. And I, I totally agree. You know, I'm I'm not... I'm not as into trying out different operating systems as you or Brian are, but I did um, take a look at Ubuntu, and it does look old. 
Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. What do you think of the brown? We often talk about the brownish orange. You know, I, I actually I you love like brown. I'm a very okay. much an earth tones it's, guy. It's 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 you, people, a lot of people out there like it. I'm not huge on it. I yeah. I don't dislike it as much as I used to because they've made a lot of tweaks over the years, and I think they've gotten to a pretty good point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would I would be thrilled if they could devote a little more time to design. Um, and I'm hoping that some of the design design decisions that I believe maybe Mr. Shuttleworth himself has made in the past were just maybe not executed as properly because so he he's have not the time. he's not leaving canonical. He's just stepping down as being. The, he's going to remain head. on the board. He's not going to be involved in the day to day operations. All right. So that's interesting. Yeah, I'm sure he's also he's a very creative person and he probably has other little things that he's kind of got in the back of his mind that sure. he's kind of been working on. So it'll go be, for it, Mark. It'll be interesting oh, to watch. Didn't you guys have him on the Linux Action Show? We a few did. Years yeah, back? it's yeah. been it's been a while, but yeah, Mark was on and we had a great conversation. Um, and uh, it, that is definitely something to, to Google up. I think you can find it over on archive.org. I'm not right. sure if you'll be able to find that older of an episode on jupiterbroadcasting.com. But if you're curious, our interview was a fun one, and I think we even did a video one with him. Oh, um, neat. Over at, you can probably just Google search Linux Action Show Mark Shuttleworth over at archive.org. All right. Well, the next story on the news docket for this week. Palm unveils their Project Ares for WebOS. It's a development tool for just rapidly programming for Palm OS. It looks awesome. It does. And we give so much time on this show to the other smart, to the Mamo, to Android, mm -hmm. to the iPhone. Um, we do not talk about Palm much because there's just not a lot going on a lot of the times in what we see for this, Palm. This might change that. So this is really cool. So this Project Ares is a totally web-based. You need to have a WebKit browser or mm -hmm. a Firefox. You need to have like Chrome or Safari or uh, Firefox. Right. And a, a, an up-to-date version. Right. You cannot, Obviously. basically what I'm saying is you can use anything but Internet Explorer. So either Gecko or WebKit based <laughs> engine. And um, this is really cool. It's literally a drag and drop application builder. Now I think... Well, it um, has the capability of being a whole lot more. There's also a right. code, uh, what do they call it, a mojo? Yeah, they have a... Interface the, of some sort? You can use, you can use, the, you can get to the back end code if you want to. So you, it's a lot like almost, and only, you know, not as kind of junky. It's Dreamweaver, where you can lay stuff out on the page, and then you can uh, click on a button and get to the code. Right. Which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, and it means that people that are already very hands-on can also take a look at... Um, they've said in this article that the debugging section of this is very um, very intense, very, oh, very good. Oh, good, very good, So good. you could already take a code that you've been working in on another thing, drop it into this, and maybe see how it works. Well, what's great for it is it, it's, you know, I, I believe to get in, like, Apple's iPhone development program, you have to kind of pony up some cash yeah. up front. Mm -hmm. I think I was able to register and start playing with this, and I built a non-functional app within great. a couple of minutes. Wow. I know. Look at wow. me. Wow. <laughs> Look at me go. I'm actually really impressed by that. I don't have any <laughs> development skills at all, so that was actually kind of cool. Um, and you can integrate in but the different components the other, of Palm OS. You know, on the other side of that, that might mean that there's all of a sudden going to be an Some inundation crap of crap apps. And you know, then you got to. I don't know how you get around that too. I guess if you have a marketplace with a rating system. Yeah, maybe. But you know, the Palm allows for. I believe I might be wrong on this, but I think the Palm does allow for third-party installations outside the repository or hmm. outside the store. So I'm not totally sure how that's going to work out. Interestingly, it's enough, got its upsides and downsides. Is basically how it comes out. It's an interesting approach, and it's it's really well done, and it's it really uh, shows the power you can get a web app. You know, like mm -hmm. a lot of times when you think of a web app, you think of like Google's applications, like Google Docs, or games, or well, those are all Flash though. Yeah, well, you know, like on Facebook, that's all Flash. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is you know like JavaScript, and you there's no like you don't have to have like that. The fl I don't think it's maybe it's Flash. I didn't see, didn't seem Flash when I launched it. It seemed like it was JavaScript. But um, I just got to say, I think this is a great step by Palm to try to get some more interest in their uh, uh, phone because right now right. their marketplace is the smallest of the smartphones. Yeah. So even I think the BlackBerry might be have might have a bigger app store, and theirs came out after the Palms did. Mm -hmm. So they, this so they're kind of response. the underdogs. This is a, a good way to drum up some more interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's an interesting phone platform too. Yeah, well, one thing I was gonna say is the Project Ares does let you integrate different components that's already in WebOS, like the maps, the dialer, the browser. So if you that's need handy. to embed a web page in your app, you don't have to recreate a web browser in your application. You just call on that web browser function. You just drag it in, in there. And yeah, exactly. It's just an object you put in there. Great. Very, very, uh, very cool, easy development style. Um, like a lot of other uh, development styles for desktop applications. Yeah. So, all right. The next story on the news docket for this week. We are cooking through these. FreeNAS <laughs> is dropping FreeBSD? Question um, mark. This is just a no. rumor at this it's, point. It, 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 so it, what started was is uh, 
uh, big thanks to Eddie over at our forum at jupitercolony.com. He posted mm-hmm. this. Uh, this is the first place I had seen this. And there was some talk that FreeBSD was considering dropping, or FreeNAS was considering dropping FreeBSD and switching to Linux for the back end because they needed to make a lot of changes anyways. And some of the things they yeah, wanted Chris, to do, inter- they inter- had to go to Linux. Yeah, uh, interrupt you for just a sec. Can you sure. give me a little bit of information on what those are? Because I don't know what FreeNAS is. So FreeNAS, uh, so FreeNAS is a way to take a really cheap PC or you know nice, mm-hmm. real minimal, and you can load this really bare bones operating system that just turns that PC into a, a very nice network file server that can serve files to Macs, oh. Windows, and Linux. So you know, a picture like you know, like a Linksys router. Right. Only it's so something you almost treat as a hardware appliance. You can stick a bunch of mm-hmm. discs in, and all of a sudden you've got a very well performing with a lot of functions. Like it has the ability to stream music to Xboxes, and it can it can share out your media libraries. It can do a lot of RAID functionality um, with a nice web click UI. It's really cool. I really wish I would have known about this. So I what, have an extra computer at home with like five hard drives in it. I could that would be perfect. So what, what's going on is IX Systems is a company that uh, commercially supported FreeBSD in the past. Mm-hmm. Or, I'm sorry, FreeNAS in the past mm-hmm. with some physical hardware. So you'd buy a box from IX Systems and they would offer oh, okay. support for FreeNAS. They have bought up FreeNAS and they're going to continue to support FreeNAS based on FreeBSD, mm-hmm. which is um, good because if you're really, you know, there's people out that are, are really, one of the reasons they're using this is because it's based on BSD instead of Linux, which is, a you know... Okay. FreeBSD is an alternative. It's a, it's yeah, a Unix yeah. operating system. I've heard a little system. bit about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be another, uh, almost a fork, but it's a different project that the uh, uh, people that want to make it Linux will be taking, and they'll be, it'll be called uh, CoreNAS, I believe. And CoreNAS is going to be the version based on Linux, and FreeNAS will continue being based on FreeBSD. Oh, okay. So CoreNAS will be based on Debian Linux, so Fre- FreeNAS, FreeBSD. It's a spinoff. Spinoff, exactly. For yeah. Yeah, it's it's like when Kramer got his own show or Elaine got her own show for a while, but it didn't work out so well. Terrible. This one might work out pretty well though, because <laughs> you know it depends on what you want. One thing that uh, Free NAS has now is ZFS, which is a file system that has a lot of popularity behind it right now. It's a very advanced file system. It lets you do entire snapshots of your drive. It lets you do great great volume management. Not available for Linux because of licensing issues. Oh, so there. It's unclear if if the ZFS is going to be lost when they switch to Linux, or if they're going to use some sort of user level driver that doesn't link directly to the kernel. We'll find out. Stay tuned. We'll probably give you an update. Yeah. All right, Jeremy. The next story on the news docket for this week: Moonlight version 2.0 is released, and Microsoft extends the patent protection beyond Novell to any Linux distribution using Moonlight. Great. So there's now, a backstory. Moonlight is an implementation of Microsoft Silverlight. Right. Are you familiar with what Silverlight is? It's kind of like a little a bit. You know, uh, to be honest, I was asked kind of at the last minute to fill in for Brian. We still wanted to do the show, so I did yeah. some research today. And Silverlight is some sort of a cross-platform. It's like a. It's like Microsoft's version of Flash. They've they've executed a thing. It's like if Adobe was to go to the drawing board two mm-hmm. years ago and come up with Flash, they would have done a few things differently. Like, f- like Silverlight. And we would have or- thanked them for it. Yeah, we would have <laughs> thanked them. Uh, Silverlight already has um, uh, like a GPU acceleration built in for you know graphics oh. card accelerator playback. Now the downside to Silverlight is is we already have Flash. It's everywhere. It's huge. Now there's this other technology, and it's made by Microsoft, and so you always have to take a bit of a pause with that. Yeah, at least most because do. they've got kind of the clout to push it to the forefront. Right, and they're trying very hard. Yeah. Um, so Moonlight comes along, and they make they take the the internals of Silverlight, and they make it run inside, say, uh, a, a Linux web browser or uh, or a standalone. So application. Silverlight itself doesn't run natively. No, in- Silverlight itself is only released for Macs and for Windows by Microsoft. Oh, okay. And Moonlight steps in, and Moonlight makes it available for Linux, but not just Linux. They also make it available for Linux running on powered PC machines, a different type of processor than mm-hmm. Intel's. There's not a version of Flash available for powered PC. So this is an area where uh, Moonlight has to step up. Um, on top of that, they've uh, they've been able to extend this agreement where Microsoft says there was some concern because Moonlight is is, us- is using by its very nature Microsoft technology, right? And there was some concern that Microsoft might go after the creators of Moonlight uh, for uh, patent infringements. Okay. And so Microsoft, uh, which was a very big deal a couple of years ago, uh, penned a deal with uh, Novell, and then they later penned a new deal regarding Silverlight and Moonlight, saying we won't sue you for using this Novell. And then everybody said, well, that's great for Novell. Now they can keep working on it. But what about us on Ubuntu and us on Fedora? And yeah. So now Microsoft has, been, has, has 
been working on some things on the back side, on the background, and now they've just said, okay, across the board, people on Linux using Moonlight are are not infringing on our patents. There's an agreement here. The things that Moonlight does use um, are covered, and that's and, and you know they almost had to because they are the Moonlight team is working so closely with the Silverlight team at Microsoft's yeah. campus mm-hmm. that I think you go into a core of law and say they flew us out there on their dime. Yeah. They They're helped engineers us make work. This. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like, how are they suing us for this? Um, but at the same time, I mean, it, it would have been easy for Microsoft to say, well, that's ours. We own you. Right, right. And the old agreement said, you're fine if you got it through Novell. But if you, but if you downloaded it off somewhere else or it came with your distribution, you're not covered. Mm-hmm. And that's what has been corrected now. It just says you're covered. That's, uh, that's good. The problem is with Moonlight Remains is that it still doesn't have the ability to play natively Windows Media because that's a codec, a licensed codec. Ah. It has the ability, but it doesn't have the codec built in. I see. And uh, so you still have to figure out a way to get that codec, either through your distribution's repo, um, or like, you know, uh, each distribution has like those extra codecs you can install, or mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. something like uh, there's um, a codec pack out there you can buy from Fluendo that it covers it legally. But you're usually going to have to purchase that. Yes. Yeah. Interesting enough. But along the same lines of uh, Moonlight and Silverlight and Flash, I thought I'd cover the last story on the news docket for this week. And that is there's a new program out there called Minitube, and it allows you to stream from YouTube right to a desktop program with no Flash needed. So this is, this is a play no for, in bed. for Mac or Linux users. The, the version for Windows does not really actually even really build and run successfully. Mm-hmm. But if you're on the Mac or you're on Linux and you don't want Flash, or, or, flash, just, flash, or like it just runs like butt or right. whatever it is, you can use this program called Minitube. It even allows you to download and play the HD versions because what it does is on the back side, it goes and gets the H.264 encoded version from YouTube. It brings that down to the player. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so you get it, you get the video. So it unlocks, and, and the reason why they can't do this for all sites is because YouTube specifically makes those H.264 encodings available for things like the TiVos and iPhones yeah, and, yeah. and Android phones. So right. those are available, and this just connects into those APIs and grabs that version. That's still a great idea, though. Yeah, and you get a nice-looking desktop program that lets you search, and it has controls, and it's it's actually a great-looking app. I'm actually I thinking find it about really funny that the uh, the little thumbnail video is, like, is, is cats playing with playing with uh, yeah, because that's whatever. what people look at on YouTube. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, not Jupiter Broadcast. No, just just oh. cats. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, this is actually a great way now to be able to stream something, and it is streaming from YouTube, so you don't have to download the file, but you don't have to be sitting on YouTube's site. You don't have to use Flash, which is a big CPU hog. This is just actually a pretty cool deal. Yeah, that sounds like it's even good for people. Like, I thought when you first mentioned this to me that it would be great for people that either didn't have or couldn't use Flash properly, but that's actually a pretty good alternative even if you can. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because you can just have, and it does sidebar, like if you search for something that on the on the left side, it has a list of all the related videos, mm-hmm. and you just click it right there, and it starts playing inside the window. Now, does... Can you tell by this article if it uh, interacts at all with your YouTube logins? Like, would you be able to access your subscriptions I and things like that? I don't know about that. Okay. It doesn't say in the article, and I, it only works on Macs or Linux right now. And I was going to download it before the show, but I, I didn't see a download link in this article. I found one later, so I'll link to that in the show notes, and you all can right. get it there. But, so I didn't get a Fair chance to try it for the show, but it just was so cool. I want to talk about it. Since I found it, I came across, I'm like, I got to talk about this. Yeah. All right. Uh, who doesn't love YouTube? So because this is the holiday edition of the Computer Action Show, it is a little shorter than normal. Um, so what we have coming up next is the interview with Leo on his HTC Hero. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we'll be back starting season two in two weeks with a full episode now with even fancier videos for those of you yeah. who watch it. But the audio version is still going to just be rocking it like always. Right. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you episode. next year. We'll see you. Wow. Yeah. In, 2000, in 2010, 2010. 2010. 2010. Where's my flying car? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right, Jeremy. Well, thanks for sitting in for the for the big B. Thanks for having me. I'm sure me. he appreciates it. Uh huh. And by the time I think, let's see, in 2010, by the next show, he might not be done moving yet. So we might have another episode where he has to where he has to st- stay out of that one. But oh. he'll be back soon. You'll so, miss him. Yeah. But Jeremy did a great job. Thanks. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening, and uh, stay tuned for the HTC review. <laughs> All right, from all the way across the entire world, something like that at least, I have Leo Leukinen. Is that how you say it, Leo? <laughs> More or less. More or yes. less. All right. I'm horrible. I, I apologize. If it makes you feel better, it's not just because it's not a, uh, a, a U.S. last name. I, I can barely say my own last name. <laughs> um, 
Did you? Uh, so you have the HTC Hero now, and something we've talked a lot about on the yes. uh, shows is the um, the different types of smartphones that are out on the market right now. And Android's a big one, so you've been using that one for a while. And I wanted to get uh, somebody from the audience's opinion of the HTC Hero. Okay, uh, I'm just going to the. Uh well, I got the uh, I got the web browser open, and I'm on the JupyterBroadcasting.com mm-hmm. live page where I can see the chat room, but there doesn't seem to be any activity on there. No, everybody's asleep still because uh, you know we didn't announce anything yet. Fnar, Fnar. Yeah. So you have the. So how do you like the web browser on the phone? Is it a pretty good web browser as far as like compared to something like say the iPhone, which gets pretty high marks? Well, to be fair. The iPhone, with its faster processor and faster capaci- uh, uh, faster specs, better specs, yeah. is better than the browser on the FTC Hero. Uh, in essence, the browser on the FTC Hero of Icon, which you can see here, is kind of stripped down, but it's more functional and easier to use than the Safari on the iPhone. Uh, mm. It doesn't support tabs, but here's the kicker. It does support Flash on web pages. Oh, very nice. So that's, yeah, that's I, definitely an improvement. Yeah. Mm. And it's still WebKit based too, so it's should, yes. if it re- it probably renders something pretty much along the same lines that Safari on mm-hmm. or the Droid might. So that's good. Uh, and how's the yeah. email client? All those kinds of things. See, I don't really know much about Android. I'm definitely considering getting an Android phone, but I don't really know all that kind of stuff. Well, this is a good thing because uh, the HTC Hero comes with its own mail client that does support POP and IMAP, but it also synchronizes your Google Mail account. Oh, that's and nice. And it, it, it has a separate Gmail, a Gmail app that you can use to send email from and to your Gmail account to other people's accounts. And there's also this nice feature in which if you've sent email and the phone gets more email, that little light here starts oh, blinking. Yeah, like a Blackberry. It, yeah, it starts blinking in a. Uh, it starts blinking green, and then when you can take your phone, you take your phone out of the pocket. You're like, "Oh, I got an email. I just press here, slide down, slap the notification window down, click. Oh, it's just another spam for my penis. Okay, <laughs> to make it bigger. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, that actually sounds like I really like the idea of integrating really tightly with Gmail, and because uh, I'm a big mm-hmm. Gmail user, I bring all of my accounts into one Gmail account. So it's nice to have it all there in one spot. Okay. It, it's so, uh, it also it also supports uh, Google Calendar and various other Google apps uh, because the whole Android experience is integrated with the Google account. So when you turn it on, it actually asks you if you have a Google account, Facebook account, and a Flickr account, and all those three things you can integrate oh, integrate nice. to it. I've heard the Palm Pre does that too. So that's interesting. Well, uh, yes, but with the HTC Hero, you have to get at least a separate app for the Facebook, Facebook if you want to do captioning uh, for the photos when you upload them. I see. Well... So, okay, so we've talked about web browser, we talked about email. While you're talking about apps, any, re- mm-hmm. any really great standout apps that I might really enjoy if I switch to an Android? Good question, Chris. Well, there are a few that I've been very happy with slacking off whilst working at the library. Uh, these are all free apps because in Finland you can't still buy any apps because Google has problems with its Google checkout. Oh, okay. Okay, well, first of all, uh, as you're a Linux user, you might be surprised or not to learn that Frozen Bubble is ported. Frozen to- Bubble, that's awesome. Yeah it's, yeah, it's ported and it actually works pretty well. Huh, okay. Well, yeah, there's also the. Do you know the Facebook app for the iPhone? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the same guy that do- did that ported that's it. That's new, to the right? Android. Yeah, it yeah. Port- I, I had the latest version and. Oh. It's really, really great. It's yeah. one of those apps you might need if you're a social networking guy. Right. There's also, I don't know how to pronounce it, but let's try it. Dara IRC, which is a IRC client that runs on the background. Okay, your phone. so you can stay logged into the IRC room. And yeah. just, that's nice. Yeah, see, that's a big plus for me is the backgrounding. Yeah. And, and that really, oh, oh, sorry, that's really something I would miss, uh, okay. something I'd miss on the iPhone and something I'd really enjoy on an Android or even a Blackberry, something like that. Okay. There's also uh, two geolocation apps that I really enjoy. Okay. First is Layar, L-A-Y-A-R, that gives you uh, gives you search results determined by where you're standing and what you're looking for. Are you looking for Twitter users? Are you looking for pizzerias? Are you looking for restaurants, hotels? Hmm. That's Cheap nice. fun. 
yeah. with women of questionable reputation. All within your radius using the GPS. Indeed. Now, are you and able to get the uh, that new uh, uh, Google navigation app over there? You mean my tracks? No, there's a there's the, a Google added turn by turn navigation to their own map oh, that, program. No, no, because I'm still running 1.5. Oh, oh, so it's, it's it can't even be installed on that phone. You have to well, have updated no. the new OS. Well, no, because uh, I I I've been waiting for the HTC to release a update for the HTC oh, okay, Hero, but it hasn't released that. There is a new RAM version, which might or might not contain 1.6, but I haven't got gotten that installed because uh, HTC doesn't support updating your phone using a Mac. Oh, really? And, yes. and now can you, you, but you could go to, to Google's Android site and download the new OS and install it yourself, just not well, have the HTC experience? Well, I guess so. I'm not really sure because uh, um, I'm still paying for the phone. I'm, I'm on the two-year plan where you pay like uh, 20, 21 euros per month, which okay. is a, to me is a good deal. So I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of careful of not doing anything like that. But I'm I've been hearing from the a a a HTC guy on the Twitter that they are going to release a, an update for the HTC Hero, sure, uh, which is one point six, which which the turn by turn thing is on the one point six. But there's this app called My Track that you can use that follows your that that will follow you and map out your route on the on the GPS enabled maps or rather Google Maps oh, which okay. you can okay. which you can then save on your SD card and upload to your Google Earth account or something. Okay. Now how's the performance been? I get you know, I hear some people say performance not so good. I hear the people say performance is great. So iffy not so great? A little sluggish? Yeah. Uh. Yeah, okay. Well, let let me tell you something. If you're in a car crash and uh, the only phone you have is is the HTC Hero, you better hope that you're not bleeding. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's it, funny. It takes like two minutes for the damn thing to turn on, and when you and when you're using your phone, you just you see that oh my camera crashes. Well, I'm going to work and I want to take a photo, so I'll t I'll just think that I'll turn it on. Turn it off and on, which fixed it. Turn it off and on while I'm walking. I wait, I wait. It's 15 degrees Celsius, minus 15 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and then the phone goes on, and it's it's taking like two and a half minutes. Huh. So the startup is kind of slow, but the the performance after it's been uh, after it's been started up is kind of okay. There are some instances where, you know, when you when you do when your screen is black, you press this key. Or it to go active, you slide down, yeah. and as you can see, sometimes it's kind of it responds fast, and sometimes it's re it responds slow when you do this after it's been turned on. Oh, okay. Well, so there's right. that. Okay. Now, overall, though, would you buy the phone again? Well, kind of a sticky issue because it has some features that I really like like the 5 megapixel camera that's nice oh I didn't realize it was 5 megapixels yes 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 but it doesn't have flash the camera is okay but it doesn't have flash not a flash the light snap, not, it yeah. does have flash video <laughs> uh, yeah well it, it also has uh, I don't know if you can see it but it, it also has the standard headphone jack oh that's here. good because the first big G1 that came out with T-Mobile didn't have a standard headphone jack yeah well it has that so, uh, and you uh, uh, and the volume controls here, so it's really easy to add, uh, to put the phone uh, phone on vibrate. Oh, okay, okay, full nice. Blast. So those are the good Rose. things. Yeah. Yes. Well, the cons cons. Well, um, there are some. For instance, the internal memory is kind of kind of low. And you can only install apps on the internal memory, right? Yes. Well, uh, but uh, to be fair, it stores all the photos, all the routes, all the music you put onto it on the SD card, okay. which is ported up to 32 gigabytes. Okay, I see. All right, so that's not too bad. Yes. Um, uh, one of the nice things also is that you can use it as a modem if you're on a Windows machine because you have to download some drivers to your machine there. So that's a nice thing. Oh, yeah, that is nice. Uh, also, you can charge it, charge it by connecting your phone to USB. To, yes. Yeah, that's nice. So that that's nice as well. Um, but the cons there. One of the cons I think is that um, 
there's no paid apps on it yet. It might be because of my region. Yeah, because so I'm pretty sure there's paid apps. Oh, maybe there's not. Yeah. Well, I can only get all the free apps, and I guess they'll roll out paid apps when they... Um, now, are there paid apps in the U.S.? I, I, I have no idea, I guess, because you Yanks always get the best things like Netflix and Google Checkout. Well, yeah, except for, in our case, the best thing we get is having to pay for stuff. <laughs> Well, the thing is that I don't think that Google Checkout, which the uh, Android market uses, isn't implemented in Finland, so it can be used yeah, to uh, yeah, okay. make purchases uh, that way. Uh, huh. So that's a con, but that's not that's something that will probably be fixed pretty soon. Is there any other physical con with the hardware or the phone itself? Or? Physical. Um, well, one of the things I don't like, as I'm a paranoid... Uh, and there's no physical keyboard, person. right? No, there's no physical keyboard. And how's keyboard, the touchscreen keyboard? Down. Is that okay? That is okay, but I'd still like to get that alligator keyboard with the uh, triangle keys, but that's a paid app, so I can't get that. Uh, I'm, I'm still waiting for Swipe to be released on the Android phone and or a normal keypad keyboard, which right. might be on the Android marketplace, right. but I haven't used that. But all in all, once you get used to the on-screen keyboard using it, Using it in this mode because if you use it, let, oh, let you me mean show using you. Actually. It vertical, or using it horizontally in the landscape Horizont, mode, yes. Yeah, it's a little easier. Uh, uh, hold on, let me. Yeah, as you can see, it's kind of a, kind use, of narrow. It looks just like the iPhone. Yeah, but when you have the um, phone in the portrait mode, as you can see, the keyboard's getting kind of cramped. Yeah, yeah, it is. And w with my big man fingers, it's kind of <laughs> hard for me to choose the correct keys that I want. Right, right. But if you if you p turn it like this. Well, hold on this. Ah, uh, this is one of the cons. When you turn it to its side, there's a Oh, it, depend, it, may, it, it cares what side you turn it to. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, as you can see here, the keys get kind of bigger, so it's yeah. easier to type. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it is, actually. Okay. So, I, I can be like typical, hur, hur, I be texting, hur, right. hur, I be texting. Right. One of the good things on the phones is the, is the, it doesn't, it doesn't fix fix your typing, but it rather suggests, is this what you meant? And as you can see here, I've written a word that it doesn't recognize, so and, it's asking and me so if, do you if touch I want it and it gives it you a list of what it, what, what it possibly yes. might... Oh, okay. After the first letter. And I have to say that the, the, the dictionary that's built into the phone is one of the things that keeps my typing above uh, 15 words per minute. Oh, okay. So it does a pretty good job of figuring out what you meant. Yes. Oh, that's good. That's definitely a good one on a touch screen where it's not physical. All right. Yeah. Well, great. Greatly. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm inching closer and closer every day to an Android phone, so I'm, I'm really thankful for getting your uh, perspective on the new phone. Well, if you want to get an Android phone, I, 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 I suggest that you'd wait a moment until they get the physical keyboard if you're into kind of that kind of stuff. I'm not sure. I think I'm okay with a touch one. So I, think, mm. I don't think that's such a big deal. I think I'm okay. Ah, okay. With it. So, all right. Well, very good. Thanks very much. Okay, no worries.